SpaceX is planning to do the unthinkable once more. The company is exploring the possibility of landing the super heavy booster on a drone ship at sea. A challenging task when considering the sheer size of the booster. While Mechazilla was intended to be the first choice for super heavy landings, it seems like a landing at sea may be a better option. Let's take a look at this mammoth undertaking and how SpaceX hopes to accomplish it. As the second orbital journey of Starship draws near, the enthusiasm among rocket enthusiasts is growing. Their curiosity extends beyond the immediate upgrades and developments of Starship to what will unfold once it reaches orbit. Particularly, there is keen interest in Super Heavy's capability to return for reuse. According to SpaceX's long-standing plan, Super Heavy is intended to be caught and returned to the launch pad. However, a substantial number still hold the belief that the safer and more efficient approach for SpaceX would be a sea landing on the drone ship, a method in which Falcon 9 has proven mastery. Since at least late 2020, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk has been proposing the idea of catching Starships and Super Heavy boosters mid-air as an alternative to the conventional method of using basic legs for landing on the ground. In this proposed approach, the Super Heavy booster would be caught by the arms of the launch tower, offering a notably gentler process compared to the suicide burn routinely employed by SpaceX on the Falcon. The suicide burn involves decelerating as rapidly as possible and executing short landing burns, a technique that allows Falcon to save a significant amount of propellant during recovery. This surplus propellant, if otherwise needed, would effectively increase Falcon's dry mass, consequently reducing its payload to orbit. Musk shared that the Super Heavy booster seems to be landing on an exceptionally small patch of steel on the tower's Mechazilla arms instead of a traditional concrete pad on the ground. Notably, during the catch, the arms of the launch tower appear motionless, creating an impression more akin to a landing. In the simulation, Super Heavy decelerates rather slowly and hovers for nearly 10 seconds towards the end. This deliberate and cautious descent, along with the gradual touchdown, may be necessary due to the remarkable precision required for Super Heavy to land on a pair of hardpoints with minimal lateral margin for error, only inches, and a few square feet of usable surface area. In addition to requiring precise rotational control, even the slightest lateral deviation during the proposed catching maneuver could lead to the Super Heavy booster toppling off the pillars. In such a scenario, the massive booster would fall approximately 100 feet onto concrete, resulting in an inevitable explosion. The deliberate slow descent and the final hovering depicted in the simulation indicate that this landing method for Super Heavy would likely consume a significantly greater amount of propellant compared to the Falcon-style suicide burn. It's crucial to note that propellant has mass, and the Super Heavy would probably need to burn at least 5 to 10 tons more to execute a careful landing on arms that aren't actively adjusting to match the booster's position and velocity. Ironically, SpaceX could potentially add rudimentary fixed legs, eliminating most of the drawbacks associated with Falcon's legs to Super Heavy with a mass budget of 10 tons. Even if these legs were made as simple, reliable, and dumb as possible, weighing a total of 20 tons, the fundamental principles of rocketry indicate that adding this weight to Super Heavy's likely 200-ton dry mass would only result in a modest reduction of the rocket's payload to orbit, approximately 3 to 5 tons or 1 to 3 percent. Furthermore, considering Musk's argument that landing on the arms would expedite the reuse process, it's challenging to discern how landing Super Heavy or Starship in the exact same quarter but on the ground instead of on the arms would bring about any significant change. If Super Heavy is accurate enough to land on a few square meters of steel, it must inherently possess the precision to land within the considerably larger breadth of those arms. The only step that landing on the arms would evidently eliminate is the reattachment of the arms to a landed booster or ship. However, it's hard to envision that this process would save more than a handful of minutes, maybe an hour of work. Simply put, while Starbase's launch tower arms will undoubtedly serve a purpose in swiftly lifting and stacking Super Heavy and Starship, it appears increasingly likely that these arms, as a landing platform, will at best be an inferior alternative to basic Falcon-style landings. More crucially, even if everything works flawlessly, and the arms successfully cooperate with boosters to catch them, allowing Super Heavy to avoid hovering and use a more efficient suicide burn, the apparent best-case scenario of all these efforts would result in marginally faster reuse and perhaps a 5% increase in payload to orbit. At this juncture, many opinions suggest that SpaceX should reconsider a landing method for basic reuse that has been proven successful with Falcon 9, landing on a drone ship at sea. In fact, the possibility of SpaceX employing a drone ship for the landing of Super Heavy is indeed on the table. Approximately three years ago, SpaceX expressed interest in landing Super Heavy on a drone ship akin to the landing process for the Falcon 9 booster. At that time, this concept was referred to as marine recovery systems within the Starship program. In a conventional launch mission, the rocket's final stage carries as little fuel as possible by the time it detaches for efficiency. While this is accurate, 
having excess fuel for the return journey would be a wasteful expenditure, considering not just the cost of the fuel itself, but also the fuel required to transport that additional fuel into space. The use of a barge in the ocean becomes an economic consideration, as it is more cost-effective to bring the rocket back on the ship than to fly it back with additional fuel. This approach allows for loading only the necessary amount of fuel required to deliver the payload, with the rocket then mostly free-falling and gliding for a powered landing on the barge. The economic implications of this strategy are substantial. If a rocket can be launched multiple times, reducing the launch cost from, say, $100 million to around $10 million per launch, it opens the door to a more accessible space industry. With the potential for even more launches, the cost could further decrease to as low as $1 million per launch. This significant cost reduction could democratize access to space-related technologies, enabling more businesses and individuals to benefit. Furthermore, it could pave the way for ambitious ventures, such as sending people to the moon, Mars, or asteroids for resource mining. As costs continue to decrease, it becomes conceivable that, in the not-too-distant future, individuals might have the opportunity to purchase a ticket for a vacation on the moon, or even contemplate the prospect of relocating to Mars. Additionally, the ability of a rocket to autonomously land on a small platform in the middle of the ocean is quite impressive. This approach offers a solution to the growing challenge of crowded land launch pads, providing a space-efficient alternative. While launching from a location where rockets could land on land might seem appealing, there are practical considerations. In the event of a mishap, certain parts of the world largely deserts may pose minimal risk if a rocket were to crash. However, these areas are often not as close to the equator as the coastal launch sites currently in use. Depending on when during the flight an issue occurs, debris could still fall outside the desert, and a significant factor is that if a rocket crashes in the ocean, there's a decent chance it can be recovered sufficiently intact for thorough study. In contrast, if a rocket were to crash on land, it would likely be shattered and scattered, making it challenging to assess what went wrong. Until rockets achieve a level of reliability comparable to airliners, launching over the ocean remains the more preferable and practical choice. This not only minimizes risks to populated areas, but also facilitates the recovery of debris for valuable insights into the root causes of any failure. Falcon 9's reliable landings on the drone ship rather than on land present a proven procedure that SpaceX could extend to their super heavy booster. However, like any method, it has its limitations. Landing and recovering giant rocket boosters at sea is inherently challenging, risky, and time consuming. While sea landings can contribute to cost reduction, the savings are not substantial. Furthermore, this approach is not efficient in swiftly turning around the rocket for the next launch. SpaceX would require time to transport the booster back to the launch pad, thereby decreasing the turnaround frequency for Super Heavy. As SpaceX aims to establish a base on Mars and plans to launch hundreds of starships and possibly thousands of fuel-carrying ships into orbit over an extended period, Super Heavy needs to ensure readiness for the immediate launch of a new starship. However, as long as sea recovery costs remain below a few million dollars, there is potential for certain launch profiles to be simplified and occasionally made cheaper by opting for a sea-based booster landing. Moreover, if SpaceX has multiple prototypes of Super Heavy that can be launched consecutively, the time required for transporting and maintaining the booster back from the sea may not significantly impact SpaceX's launch rhythm. While this perspective is subjective, it undeniably adds an exciting dimension to the possibilities in SpaceX's endeavors. What do you think? Should SpaceX take a risk and use a drone ship for Falcon Heavy landings? Please share your thoughts in the comments below.